Very good. So, very nice to be with everyone again. Uh, today, we're going to do the next part of the uh, battle and prayer, the radiant aspiration. And this is a Mahayana Sutra. That is to say, it's uh, connected with the second turning of the Wheel of Dharma when Buddha Shakyamuni was uh, teaching at the Vulture Peak Mountain in Bihar. And uh, as we will see, the, the orientation is always towards the benefit of all, to include others. When you open yourself to being with others, uh, they will disturb whatever plans you have. And uh, this aspiration, this wish that comes from this uh, time of the previous Buddha is uh, an expression of a willingness to take the suffering on oneself in order to alleviate others. So th this uh, sutra coming from the, the time of Buddha Dipamkara, the Buddha, who is like a butter lamp. And with this, we have a, a sense of the importance of non judgmental connectivity. Usually in life, we are concerned with a, a transaction. So if I meet you, I'm kind of checking you out. Do I like you? Do I not like you? Is there some advantage in getting to know you or not? And then having made my judgment, I open myself more or less to you. So it's as if the qualities I perceive in you are the kind of gatekeeper or uh, door which determines how much of myself I make available. But in our Mahayana practice, we're using our understanding of emptiness to dissolve the basis for these solidifying judgments so that we get more sense of the open potential or Buddha nature in all sentient beings. Whether beings are young or old, healthy or sick, uh, pleasing to us or not pleasing to us, they are equal in their Buddha nature. So most people like butterflies, but the welcome we give to mosquitoes is probably a bit less. But the butterfly and the mosquito are equal in their Buddha potential. So for our Mahayana practice, our uh, compassion or our uh, unedited welcome to all beings as they are is uh, maintained by our understanding that they are empty of inherent existence. All beings are the same in the Dharmakaya. A mosquito has a mind. It has particular kinds of obscurations that have led to manifesting in this uh, insect form. But this thickness of these clouds or, or obscuration, which have uh, diminished the capacity to radiate clarity, these uh, obscurations have no inherent existence. They are like illusions. They are like clouds. So <clears throat> in this sutra, the title in Tibetan is Gyapo Sergei. Which means um, this is a, this sutra is a story and an aspiration. The story is the story of the lamp of King Golden Hand, and in this story uh, there is a, an account of the aspiration that he makes for the benefit of all. <clears throat> So it begins salutation to the three jewels. When Dipankara, the Buddha of the earlier period before the time of Buddha Shakyamuni was teaching, 
King Golden Hand asked him, Venerable one, what was the basis of the virtue that you created in former times, resulting in you now displaying the major and minor signs of a Buddha and radiating infinite light from your body? So again, this is a, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a question in the Mahayana tradition because it's asking what are the causes that allowed your potential for awakening to shine forth? <coughs> when we studying according to the view of Sokshen, <coughs> we're looking at the immediacy of the <coughs> revelation of light from the ground in an uninterrupted way because there we have the the view uh, according to the um, the result which is the uh, unimpeded manifestation whereas here we're looking at a causal vehicle a concern with what are the causes which can bring about the ripening and fulfillment of the Buddha potential? <clears throat> and Buddha Dipankara replies, listen, great king, when I was an ordinary being, in front of all the Buddhas of the 10 directions, I developed altruistic bodhicitta. Then I dipped 1000 cotton wicks in clarified butter and placed them on my body. Without hope or expectation, I lit them as an offering to all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and the Three Times. That is why I am now known as Buddha Dipankara, the one who made the butter lamp. Oh. <clears throat> this is not about um, self-torture or an ascetic practice. <clears throat> it's not masochistic. He says, without hope or expectation, means in a relaxed, even way, feeding the heat, feeding the burning of the flesh, I offer my body. In our modern culture, this is not uh, a very common or popular idea. We <clears throat> we're happy to sacrifice money by making dana offerings or helping to put up butterfly uh, <clears throat> prayer flags and so on. We can give our time and energy to doing dharma activity. So, uh, giving our mind or our speech, well, we can understand. And we might give our body in terms of going on a long walking pilgrimage or helping to build stupas. But here, uh, a body is being offered as a butter lamp with a thousand wicks burning on it. So, usually we are very identified with our body. And uh, in former times, uh, there was a lot of um, action on the body in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with swords, people being tortured for going against the king and so on. If someone was living in 15th century Europe, they would understand this kind of activity much more than we can. But generally, we are very committed to the freedom of the body. Oh, one has to imagine oneself into a way of considering that this would be a, a noble and generous activity. But when he heard what the Buddha Dipankara said, the great king rejoiced. He wrapped his own right hand in cotton wool, dipped it in clarified butter and lit it. He raised his left hand to the sky and said, Buddhas of the Ten Directions and Buddha Dipankara, my teacher, please think of me. With a mind free of regret, he clearly visualized all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions. He dedicated, <clears throat> he dedicated the merit of this offering 
given without expectation and made this following prayer of aspiration. This is costing him. He's going to use the function of his right hand. He is without regret. This kind of practice continued into in Tibet until recently, maybe it still does. I don't mean uh, monks burning themselves to death in a gesture of defiance or despair. But this is an offering of the body. Of course, <clears throat> in our background uh, cultures, uh, non-Buddhist cultures usually, we are aware that uh, the focus everywhere is on just one life. This is our sole chance. A chance for what? To enjoy life. To have a good time. To, to travel and eat good food and laugh and dance and sing. But from the point of view of the Dharma, we have many, many lives. <clears throat> Each life is an opportunity to bring us closer to an understanding of what is truly central. Our precious life, our cherished body, very easily becomes the basic site of our identity. This is me, and I have to protect my body because it's a fundamental aspect of who I am. Well, as many of you will know, we have the practice of churn, which is a, a practice focused on separating, separating the potential of the mind from the present limited form of the body. And we have available, I think, probably in all our languages now, translations of the Jataka stories. These are the stories of Buddha Shakyamuni's previous lives and the actions that he did for the benefit of others. And uh, it's very important when in the beginning of this, he's saying that there's no expectation, no sense of gain, no fear of loss. And it's this equanimity which brings the purity of even the most radical behavior. So, for example, in a previous life, Buddha Shakyamuni had been wandering in uh, Nepal, and he came across uh, a tiger which had just uh, given birth. But the tiger was very uh, wasted and thin, and had no milk for feeding her, her babies. So this prior form of the Buddha was moved by great compassion because not only was the mother sick, but the babies would starve and die. So he, he thought he would offer some of his body to the, to the tiger. He put a finger into the tiger's mouth but she was too weak to chew it. So he put in his wrist thinking it was a bit softer, but still she, her teeth weren't able to break through his skin. So he looked around and he took a piece of a, the edge of a bamboo tree and he slit his wrist and put the bloody wound into the tiger's mouth. Gradually, she was able to start to absorb the blood and then to drink it down. And gradually, the tiger became stronger and was able to eat him, which fed both her and her pups. Now, if we look at this from a Judeo-Christian point of view, uh, human beings are God's chosen people placed above all the different animals. So this uh, behavior doesn't make much sense. But from the Buddhist point of view, 
all sentient beings have Buddha nature. And this central Mahayana idea that all beings have been our own mother in a previous life. So this tigress is not just our sentient being, but is for this previous form of the Buddha, a sentient being who has been my mother in a previous life, who has sacrificed so much for me. And therefore, this offering of himself is on one level paying off the debt that he owes, which is beneficial for him on a relative level. And it's supporting this uh, tigress on a relative level as well. But he's able to do this because he is calm and relaxed in his own uh, unchanging awareness. He is making use of his embodied potential. And it also gives him the chance to disidentify with the transient form of the body. Now that I'm a bit sick, I remember so many things I've done in my life. They seemed important. They seemed a good idea at the time. But I look back and wonder, what was that all for? so desperate to be with particular people, so needing to walk in the Himalayas on pilgrimage. What was it for? It made me happy. But where is that happiness now? So when we read this kind of text, it gives us a chance to reflect on what is our hierarchy of value. Moment by moment, we are attributing value in that way, the, the clarity of our mind, which can connect with the immediacy of events, is mediated through the distorting crystal of our karmic patterns and uh, distortions. And so sim simple limited forms in the world seem to be very shiny for us and we put so much effort into them. Some people want to sail around the world in a small boat all by themselves. Some people want to be drug smugglers to make a lot of money quickly. We look around the world, we see so many different kinds of behaviors can be very important for certain people. So we can use this text as a way of reflecting on our own personal template, what are my values? And when we see that other people seem to see the world differently and to make different choices, we shouldn't uh, sit in judgment about them saying, oh, I agree with this, it's good, I don't agree with that, it's bad. But rather we can see, oh, they do that kind of choice and that's valid for them and I do this kind of choice and this is valid for me. There is no inherent truth in the choices I make. I'm operating from my dualistic consciousness which carries the, the twists or the um, intensifications and lack of interest for this and for that, then we can see, oh, I live in my world. I think I'm seeing how it is, but I'm actually seeing a reflection of my interests. And these uh, positionings are not stable. So, for many years, President Assad of Syria was regarded as a bad man for being so cruel to his own people. But now it suits many of the uh, political leaders in the area where he lives to welcome him back as one of their group because it is 
politically expedient. We are situationally responsive, and that response is mediated according to our notion of what is good for me. So we have to, to hold in mind that uh, if we think, oh, what this uh, Buddha did in a previous life is not very wise, and we judge that behavior according to our own uh, system or template, yeah, judging the outer form. What is the inner intention to bring light to all beings? That is amazing. That's not a, a personal ambition. It's not a, an ambition for, for him all about me. He is for the other. And that is the great transformation whether our manifestation in this life is for the benefit of the other or is simply for our momentary uh, notion of what we like and what we don't like, what we need and what we don't need. But first, I should read through the Tibetan of it to give you the Nung. My throat's a bit sore today, so I'll have to go a little bit slowly. Jaga kidu raja kanya pa hu de pa tuya prata ritsaya tra preta di dasuta bekind japo sergi rapa narme lo juta molam ki yo tonjo sumlan chasalo no sanje marme de ki tumba ze pe du na ja pa se ge la pa she chawam be chom den de marme de la di ke che chon te tumba ke ngun gi du na ge we se wa che shi cha na de ta sin da pe che du dem ban te ko le wo ze ta ye pa yu we gu gang la ken gang la chom den de ke ta sa pa jal po chen bo yu chi ne su su ke ba du na Chuchu sanje tamche la chanchu tu senke ne lula rabagi yu til mar ki nandu en tupanton tu te chuchu du senke sanje tamche la temba me pe chupa pulbe and Sanje Marmeze Che Chawa Gyo Yino Che Son Peda De La Jabo Chimbo Shintu De Irante Tene Jabo De Rangye Lapa Yepa Reba Magi Tsube Che Ti Me Tangne La pa yun ke barna la kang te. Che che san je tam che ta. La ghi tim be jom den de. Mar me ze gong su so lo. Yo pa me pa. Sen ki. Che che san je tam che. Yin ki yin gong su ndu me te. Den ba me pa. Che pa. So, so, now we start to uh, go into the text. And when we recite this, we hold our hands up to the sky with the palms open to honor uh, 
King Golden Hand because his right hand is burning, but his left hand he holds up to the sky in a flat palm open way as an offering. This lamp is for all sentient beings. And of course, it's not a lonely action because he calls Buddhas of the Ten Directions and Buddha Deepankara, my teacher, please think of me to be held in mind, to know that someone thinks of us, it's very important. So his action in offering this hand is a relational communication. He's imagining the Buddhas, thinking of them, seeing their faces, feeling their love flowing towards him. And he's making this offering to them to let light flow to all beings. Oh. We can imagine that we are offering all the potential of our body, speech, and mind for the benefit of all. And then it continues. So he says, may the pot of this lamp become as vast as the infinity of all the countless worlds. May the wick become as big as Mount Meru, the king of mountains. May the rays of its light reach from the top of this world down to the beings in the lowest of Vichy hell. So in the previous weekend, we uh, went through the various sections of offering a butter lamp uh, as representing different aspects of the Buddhist view. And what is important here is that we are taking our imagination and bringing it into service of the Dharma. Because here we have uh, the aspiration from this king. He's not saying, Oh, look, I'm burning my hand. Ow, 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 I'm a good boy. He's imagining this gesture, which is intense, but also limited, is vast. With his imagination, he is turning something which could be limited and self-referential into something vast and for the other. So this is a, a major part of the practice we can follow. In every action that we do, we can make it vast. If you're doing ritual practices, it often says we offer these uh, items we have collected, the, the items we have gathered, the talk are some fruit, some biscuits, some wine, and so on. But then we always say, and all that can be imagined by my mind. It's not about piling up a lot of stuff. But in a sense, what we offer is a symbol of all that we can imagine. Because what we can imagine is more important than what we actually have. Again, that's not our ordinary way of thinking of things. I will offer you a glass of water and imagine it champagne. So if you imagine it champagne, that's what you'll get. Normally we would say, uh, uh where's the champagne? I want the real thing. But of course in the Dharma, we say there is no real thing. Everything is illusion. So when I put on my glasses and I see, Sorry, on you go. And I see the benefit of that. I can say, may all sentient beings have whatever they need to uh, alleviate the misery of their uh, disability. And if you have time, you can unpack that a little bit. May there be wheelchairs for those who cannot walk. May there be artificial limbs for those who have lost them. And when we drink something, we can imagine if it's a hot drink, may this warm all the beings in the cold hells. If it's a cool 
a cold drink, we can say, may this cool all the beings in the hot hells. When you open the tap to put some water in a jug, can you imagine? May all the places where there are forest fires receive rain from the sky. May it protect all the insects, the centipedes, the snails, the small animals, the squirrels, the chipmunks. In this way, a small gesture like opening a tap can connect you with so many beings who are suffering. So it's, we translate this as aspiration in, in Tibetan, it's monlam. It's a, a, a path of good wishes. And this can be the path of your life. We, are, of course, have different kinds of meditations, some of which are more direct for awakening to awareness. But this practice of being for the other, allowing your mind to move out into the world to identify the places of suffering is very important. So in the Mahayana practice of dedicating the merit, we often say things like, may this merit go to all sentient beings without even one exception. And when we uh, do the practice, we're imagining the rays of blessing are coming towards us. And in front of us are our enemies or the people we don't like or don't want to help so that they get the blessing first. Every action we do can be for the other and simultaneously act to dissolve this dark core of selfishness that lurks in our heart. Then he says, Shaya, Chari Chambo Chigyana, Chancherangili Kirpe, Jibbe, Munga Chambo Nangwa, Rangi Lapa, Yanke Yambe Mitone, Chinche Nangshin Salwarachi. May the rays of its light reach beyond the iron mountains ringing our world system to reach the people who are living in the enveloping gloom of the darkness created by their own bad actions and who cannot even see the movements of their own hands. May this light spread illumination there. So in traditional Indian cosmology, the center of our world is this vast Mount Meru. It's very high. Day begins when the sun comes from behind the mountain and night begins when the sun goes behind this mountain. Around it are the four main continents, each with two subsidiary continents. Then around them, there are seven rolling oceans. And then the great ring of iron mountains, which uh, encircle everything that we know. So when you say, may these light rays reach beyond this ring of iron mountains, it means may it go beyond the limits of my knowledge. Every year we can hear that in the tropical forests, research scientists have found new species of uh, moths and uh, different insects and uh, animals. So he's saying, may this light not be limited by my knowledge of what or who might be there, but may it include all and all and all beings beyond my imagination. And especially in the beings who are living in the darkness created by their own bad actions. Some who can't even see if their hand is in front of their face. We want the light to go there. It is very, very important to uh, understand uh, karma. In the First World War, when people had, uh, on the British side anyway, when they got uh, shot or got blown up, people would say, oh, bad luck, old chap. Because we don't want to say God did this to you. We want to believe in a nice God, not a punishing God anymore. So if God's not punishing us, 
It just happens. It's bad luck. But in Christian theology, we don't really have an idea about who it is who gives out luck to different people. Some uh, Protestant sects uh, develop the idea of the elect, that people would be chosen to go up to heaven and that there is nothing that the others could do to make it happen. God knows you and God chooses you, but we don't know why. Now, we don't know then if we can say, but when I cut my hand uh, peeling the potatoes, uh, has God done this? Have I been elected by God to be a bloody potato peeler? Oh, we don't have these problems with uh, karma. The root of karma is not to see the open ground of all beings. Moment by moment, as we are sitting together, looking at this text, you are within a stream of experience. Some of the experience seems to be you, like sensations in your body or memories or sudden thoughts. And some of it seems to be out there. What is the source of this? Because I start from the idea that I am me and you, you are something other. This duality, which seems uh, completely normal and true for us, is in fact a delusion. So in Sokshen, when we relax and open, we open to the ever open ground. And if we're doing a tantric practice, we begin by opening to the clear blue sky and within that the deity arises as a form of light. Space is the foundation. When we see this, then everything is included in space because it has no top or bottom, no sides, no beginning or end. The space of the mind includes each and every experience. No experience is coming from outside the mind into the mind. The mind is not the subject, the mind is not the object, but both subject and object are movements within the mind. They are not entities. Then when we see this, every movement we make is an is a interactive co-emergence within space. But if we don't see the ground is space, we take our ground to be our inherent existence, I am myself, I'm not you. Maybe I like you, maybe I don't like you. And that feeling will change according to circumstances. I don't know how I'm going to feel. So this is the uh, darkened or uh, opaque experience of the individualized ego self, which is actually a delusion, acting according to the darkness or confusion of believing in my own separate existence. I act on the world to try to increase my benefit and to avoid anything harmful or difficult for myself. So then I'm like a hustler. I'm, you know, looking out for me, number one. And this is the basis for the accumulation of karma. The root of karma is, the, is our immersion in the dualistic vision. I'm acting for me onto the world, which could be onto you. And uh, one of the particular features of this mental dullness is that we take the transient phenomena to be very important and we act according to our interpretation and we find ourselves in this increasingly complex world in which all kinds of things happen, but we don't know why. Just we don't know. 
how will we stop climate change? Why don't people do their best? Why would someone like Assad, who is a mass murderer, be welcomed with a big hug? Maybe the people who hug him are also ambitious to be mass murderers. We don't know. Inside duality, relying on the uh, conceptual-based interpretations of consciousness, so much sorry so much of life is mysterious and it's this which gives people like uh, president trump a lot of power because he says all your troubles are caused by bad people you are good people i am a good person i don't cause trouble but the deep state these Sneaky people, they cause all the trouble. All our troubles are caused by other people. And it's amazing how clear and powerful we can feel when we blame. We are all susceptible to be pulled into dogmas about who is good and bad, what is right and wrong. So when we are in this uh, aspiration of King Goldenhand, when we are considering the environments in which different creatures live, they're not just an accident. They're not just generated by some kind of happenstance of evolutionary events. The cows in the field, the chickens in their enclosed stinking uh, halls, clearly they're having experiences but they don't understand why. They don't rely on conceptual thought the way that we do. But even our intelligent conceptual thought, maybe reading and studying and trying to join the dots so that we understand, that doesn't bring us to wisdom. It brings us to the accumulation of knowledge. In the Buddhist text, wisdom means always the wisdom of emptiness. If we don't access the empty ground from which everything is ceaselessly emerging, then all we have is the conceptual interpretations based on the idea that I am not you, I am real and you are real. So when we consider this, we can awaken inside us what is called, what is called compassion arising on the basis of Dharma. Because now we have access to the Dharma teachings on the nature of the mind <laughs> and how manifestation occurs. But the beings in the hell realms don't have this. Hungry ghosts don't have this. The animals, the fish, the birds, they don't have this. The uh, Asuras, the jealous gods, they don't have this. The gods don't have this. Because whether you're dominated by pain or fear or pleasure, and whatever, if whatever is arising for you seems just true in itself, then the door to wisdom is blocked. So we have this uh, rare and precious opportunity of being able to connect with the teachings which have come down to us through the presence of Buddha Shakyamuni in the world. So receiving all this Dharma, we don't keep it for ourselves. We're not like a squirrel hiding nuts for the winter, but we share it. We can share it directly if we are able to teach. If our own practice is not quite ripe enough to do this, we share it through spreading rays of light, saying prayers for the benefit of others, including all beings in our practice. So when we do that, then this uh, last line in that uh, little section we read, may this light spread illumination there to all these places. This really makes sense to us. Okay, uh, let's take a break now. If we could come back at... Uh, 
quarter two, which gives us just over 20 minutes. See you soon. So, <clears throat> then the text says, Union de Zangye Sanje Ji Shi Shipadi Shi Nu Niparanju Shi Jani Chuju Ji Tengi Kale Taye Pana Shipi Sanje Jami Parere Chen Lam Du Salwaran Jun Chi. May this light remain for the duration of all periods of all the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. May this light shine before the eyes of all the numberless Buddhas in the countless worlds which pervade the ten directions. Oh, he's <clears throat> making this aspiration that the, the virtue of what he's done and the light that's shining forth, may it have no limit of duration and may it have no limit of uh, situation. Maybe it be everywhere and for all time. And may it rise up to shine for the eyes of all the Buddhas. So this is a, a very important orientation for our practice. It is the absolute confidence that an aspiration or a gesture of connectivity is actually effective and that we are not alone and the Buddhas receive all that we do. Isolation is death. We rely on the environment to keep us going. And mental isolation is also a kind of death and we know that solitary confinement is used as a punishment. From the very beginning, there is the sole ground. There are not different grounds. So we're not stuck in a dualistic notion that there has to be God who makes the good things and the devil who makes the bad things. All appearances arise from the primordially pure ground. Yep. They are pure in themselves. There is no actual division or fragmentation in the field of disclosure or the, the radiance of the mind itself. So in Sokshen, we access this directly. And in the Mahayana tradition, we do it through expanding our imagination to cover the vastness of space and time. Both are ways of accessing the undivided ground. And in particular, <clears throat> as a profound antidote to the feelings of lostness, isolation, desolation, which hover around. So we have these questions like, where was God in Auschwitz? There's probably no answer to that. But what we do know is that the true nature of Auschwitz was empty which is the same for wars. Everything has a basic nature of illusion, like a, a mirage. Just because some situations are happy doesn't make them real. And just because some experiences are fear-inducing or painful or terrifying doesn't make them real. The six realms of samsara are delusions arising from karma. The eight hot hells, the eight cold hells, the two intermediate hells, these are all experiences which are powerful. And yet, each moment of that experience has no inherent, internal essence or existence holding it in place. We can't say that the hells are in a particular place, and yet <clears throat> they have uh, an existence for those who are there. We can't say that they're only uh, a mental hallucination, because while they continue, they have uh, an impact which uh, takes the dualistic mind to believe they are real. 
illusion is the midpoint between truly real and substantial and self-existing and on the other side uh, unreal non-existent uh, vanishing completely the buddhas are also an illusion illusion is not a negative term it's simply one way of describing the ungraspability of an appearance which we see, which we have a sense of, and yet you cannot catch it. And when we see that our life is like that, then maybe we can appreciate that actually everyone we know is ungraspable. Every, well, if we're talking of humans, every human has a name. But each of these beings is much more than their name. The name is like a corral. So a wild horse is put in the wooden corral and gradually it adapts to that. But that particular corral is only one of the many places it could be. So there are many different corrals we experience. There are corrals of uh, the shape of our body, our age, our age, gender, nationality, education. Each of these identifications becomes a kind of encircling uh, security that, oh, I know who I am, what I am, what I do. But these are only names, these are signs conceptual indications which cannot catch the actual phenomena. So then he says, Something la supra numbra jupe kaba dan dembra junchi. So he says, May the light from this lamp illuminate the formless realms. The formless realms are the highest realms of samsara. We enter them on the basis of having great stillness in meditation. If you are born in that situation, you, you don't have a form. But you're there as a pure consciousness which remains undisturbed for tens of thousands of years. But they're also within samsara. So, if you normally, when you when you're karmically determined time for being in that realm is uh, finished, there's a shock because you reborn in another realm where you take on a body, everything is more crude. So it's not uh, a state of liberation. So that's why we want to, the, this light may it spread to those in the formless realms because they are not free of suffering. So he says, with that illumination, as soon as the gods of these realms are aroused, May they gain the major and minor signs of enlightenment and be freed from the mental absorptions of the four levels of sut subtle sensory support. So we want to arouse them towards enlightenment. So there's a traditional list of the major and minor signs of enlightenment. Oh, for example, with Buddha Shakyamuni, we see that between the point between his eyes, he has a small uh, lump which comes out called the urna. And on the top of his head, he has a, a raised uh, bump or lump, which is maybe, I don't know, five centimeters high, maybe more. So it's called the Ushnisha. It's a uh, representing something of the uh, difference of his being. He has slight webbing between his fingers and toes. And 
and you can see lists of all these different aspects. So in terms of the Mahayana view, which here is still within duality, although we have a Buddha nature, uh, the Buddha is different from us. And this difference is marked by how he looks. This is not the view of Sokshin. So the four uh, levels of subtle sensory support, these are just the four stages in the formless realms. So if you read the early Buddhist texts, they talk a lot about peace. In one way of describing uh, nirvana or where you, where you have uh, liberation is it's a place of peace. But the Mahayana critique of this says, peace is all very well, but you're kind of useless. Nice for you. But the peace you find is, is a kind of protected space away from disturbance. And if you want if you want to come into the world and manifest compassion for others, disturbance is going to be part of that process. The mother has to be able to hear the child calling. So in the same way, the Buddha sees the suffering in samsara. They are both disturbed and not disturbed. Yeah, they are disturbed in as much as they they can mobilize to send blessing and rays of light or active intervention within samsara to help the person, but also not disturbed in as much as the energy of the Buddha's mind flows like a rainbow light or like the sunlight through the sky, and it doesn't alter the openness of the mind. So, may entry to the various meditative states of the Tathagata be, obtain, be available to these fortunate ones, means that the meditative state is maintained while there is connectivity. For example, if you remember that when you read the Heart Sutra, the Buddha is sitting in his meditation, and due to the uh, non-dual intention in the Buddha's mind, Chenrezi speaks to Shariputra. So without moving, without being disturbed, there is connectivity. And, and at the end of the Heart Sutra, it says, then the Buddha says uh, to uh, Chenrezi, very good, very good. It's just as you described it. So while is the Buddha is resting in this profound meditation, he's not cut off from the world. He hasn't gone into some private realm. This is the non-duality of stillness and movement. And this is what we aim to, to achieve through, through our practice. Then he says, May the light from this lamp illuminate the realm of the gods with form. May these gods enter meditative absorption and experience unwavering happiness and gauge the stage of non-return. So again, here you can see the rays of light are inviting the, the gods in the form realm, which includes the sensuous gods, to become awakened where they are. They don't have to uh, come out of that god state, but if they enter into this meditative absorption in that state, they can find uh, certainly the, the experience of not having to return to samsara. Then he says, Marmedi de Kanki, Lanankye Nisu Nashin Savoranjuchi, De Kanki Lanankya, Zaire de Belongjula Semna, Ma Cheshing, 
Rangi Semla Ta Shing. Something she la rimbaki nyumbra chupe. Talpa down dembaranju chi. So he says, may the light from this lamp illuminate the environment of the gods of the realm of desire. May these gods be free of attachment to the richness of their realm. May they look at their own minds and enter into each of the four meditative absorptions in turn. May this be available to these fortunate ones. So this is um, an important point because he's saying uh, in these gods where there are all kinds of uh, sensory pleasure there are so many interesting things to do if you want music it plays automatically if you want to have delicious food it's there in front of you you have the instant satisfaction of your desires now, for many people in Western countries, the uh, way in which our lives are organized are really like a god realm in comparison with a villager in ancient India or in Tibet. They had no central heating and no air cooling system for the summer. But we have, if we have a little money, we can resource ourselves with so many things. But he's pointing to the, the danger of this. Because, because he said, may they be free of attachment to all these uh, objects, these sources of enjoyment. And may they look at their own minds. This is the central point. In our world at this moment, people are looking outside. And and as the negative karma of many people ripens and we have more wars, economic difficulties, floods, storms, and so on, these are all invitations for our attention to go outside. What can we do? How can we make things better? So if we, if we are committed to the dualistic view of a subject inside and an object outside, then how will you ever look at your mind? Because the veil to your own mind is your sense, I am the subject, this is me, here I am, I know who I am. So he's saying, may, may all of these gods look at their own minds and each enter into the four meditative absorptions. So we, we touched on the four meditative absorptions before. These are like the these four levels in the formless realm. But for the gods coming from these sensory realms where they have so much enjoyment, entering the formless realm is like entering a rehab. Generally for addictions, we think of the 12-step model but here we have the four stage model where you have less and less excited involvement in what is occurring. Because the, the, the pure experience of the formless realms is to see, I have no inherent need to identify with physical formation. Just as in the mind, thoughts, feelings, sensations arise and pass, so my uh, embodied experience is indeed experience. It's a whole stream of moments of this experience, that experience. My body is not a thing I have. It's a site of my energy participation in the field of energy or my appearance uh, moments in the field of appearance. So then he says, uh, mm -hmm. 
Tse yid la jipe dan dambaranju chi. May the light from this lamp illuminate the realm of the demigods. May they be freed from their pride, fury, and crudity, and develop love, compassion, joyfulness, and equanimity. May they develop minds that are calm. So what he's saying is, may this light transform itself into the antidotes which are particularly useful for this specific environment. So this is similar in the church practice where you invite the four categories of guests to come. And uh, the basic offering, which is your own body, arises as light and forms of beauty for offering to the Buddhas. And it arises as uh, palaces and jewels and wonderful music for the next uh, level of gods, the, the more worldly gods. And it arises as flesh and blood and so on for those uh, beings who would like to enjoy this. And it transforms in also into uh, special, um, easy to access uh, pleasures for the frightened uh, demons or the frightened spirits who can't come, who feel too scared to come into the main feast. So in the Dzogchen tradition, we are familiar with the image of light coming into a crystal and spreading out as this rainbow colored light. The light of the mind is ungraspable, but when it refracts to participate in energy to participate in the world it's like all the rich creativity of our imagination there is no essence or substance to any of this but the potential shows as required instantly so the the demigods are the ones who uh, feel persecuted by the gods in uh, the realm of the demigods, a, a wonderful tree uh, arises, which grows up into the realm of the gods. And the gods get the fruit of this tree. And the, the, these uh, demigods, the lesser gods, are furious about this. They are envious. It's not fair, it's an injustice. And, but there's no police to call. So, so they rise up as an army to go to fight for what is right. But the, the gods always win. So they feel defeated, hopeless, envious, furious. So this is a very important thing for us all to consider. Life is not fair. Some women who want to have babies can't have babies. Some women who get pregnant don't want to be pregnant. In every situation we can think of, somehow, however it is, our mind can uh, find it difficult. For example, if I go to a hot place uh, by the seaside, I go down to the sea, with my towel, I lie on the towel for 10 minutes. I look around, people are very relaxed, just enjoying this. But I'm a bit, I'm a bit bored. So I get up and pick up my towel and go for a walk along the beach. I see the pattern of the waves, I see the little children playing and splashing in the water. Well, that's my kind of pleasure, not lying on the beach. So this is so interesting how our own tendencies, what we have inherited from our previous activity, gives us more or less access to any situation. We as human beings are 
fortunate because usually we can make some choice in our situation. But these demigods, they, they can't make a choice. They are so caught up with the injustice and the perversity of their situation that they feel they have to fight and fight even when they can't win. Then he says, uh, May the light from this lamp illuminate the beings who inhabit the four continents. May they be freed from the eight sufferings and may they gain transcendental diligence. So we are uh, one one group of the beings who, who live on these four islands. We live on the southern island of Jambudvipa. And uh, on the different uh, islands, there are different uh, kinds of situations. So on one island, people live for 2,000 years. But on our island, we have an indeterminate lifespan. We can die at any moment. So we suffer from these uh, eight sufferings. So we have birth, we have old age, sickness and death, separation from the ones we want to be with and having to be with the ones we don't like and not getting what we want. And the, flush, the flourishing of the five skandhas. So the five skandhas are these five factors which aggregate together and give us the sense of our embodied existence. The five skandhas flourish when we believe in them. So I can say my body, my feelings, my perceptions, my intentions and capacities, my consciousness. And every time I confirm that this is me, I strengthen the delusion that these uh, five skandhas uh, form an integral individual. So the saying, may the beings in our situation develop this transcendent diligence. That is to say, may we be diligent, may we be hard working with regard to the Dharma or, or for our study and practice, and, but may it be transcendent. That means to say inseparable from emptiness. Because if you start to think, oh, I've heard all about samsara, it arises from our bad karma, from our uh, ignorance and unawareness. It's unreal. But, but dharma is real. Dharma is our refuge. It's reliable. It's a good thing. That way we go crazy. Because we're just uh, emphasizing a dualistic uh, split of samsara bad, nirvana good. So everything is ungraspable. Make your butter lamp, you light the match, you light the butter lamp, it's immediately burning up. You open your practice text and you start. As soon as you say, this is vanished. The practice is word after word after word, thought after thought after thought. There is no inherent existence in the text. It is, it is a method a dynamic method to reduce our reliance on our own uh, solidification of the world on the basis of our concepts. So our dharma has value and is empty. Our, our suffering and our confusion causes difficulties and is empty. So then he says, Mami de Joson Nangi Nisu. Nashi is a bonjour, cheer, Joseph. 
Didachi Lachi. Jiwa dan de dun dan se ba dan koe dunya dan le mole tarne shera number sundan de branjuchi. May the light from this lamp illuminate all those who live in the animal realm. May they stop eating each other and be freed from the suffering of fighting, killing, being enslaved, and being dull and stupid. May they gain the wisdom of hearing, thinking about, and meditating on the Dharma. Well, this is the situation of animals. If you're a dog, you have someone to take care of you. They might even be willing to pick your shit off the street. But you pay a price for this. You get a walk when the boss says, let's go for a walk. You eat what's given to you. So there are rough forms of slavery and uh, uh, pampered forms of slavery. So for the animals, we wish that they have the opportunity to study and reflect and meditate so that Dharma can go into them. Because in their current state, even if you say omani hum pay me hum to them, they don't they don't understand anything. Then it says Marme di Shinje Jikten do no shin sawan ju chi shinje na such jepa dan de dun ki le tarne de shin se pa tam shi ki paro tu chimbe dabe. May the light from this lamp illuminate the realm of the Lord of Death. May, those cruel, may these cruel ones cease from killing, cutting, and beating. May they be taught the six transcendental, transcendental qualities by the Tathagata, and by this, may they develop generous attitudes towards all beings. Oh, in the tradition, there are different accounts of what happens when we die. In Dzogchen, we usually look in terms of the bardos, in which uh, various opportunities open up to us as we uh, leave this uh, seemingly stable site of our body in this life. And then it's up to us whether we can open to the opportunities of the uh, clarity of the tune the first bardo the chuni bardo or the peaceful deities or whatever but here it's describing a slightly different vision in which when we die we go to this uh, great uh, court of the lord of death and uh, his followers then uh, take us and they examine our karma and then they beat us and chop us up if we are to be punished. So when we're in this life, if someone attacks us, we can cry out, help, help. Maybe someone will help. But at death, when you go under the power of the Lord of death, they don't care. This is a site of suffering. And so screams are in the air. So here he's not so concerned with the victim or the one who's being punished, but he's concerned with Shinje and the, the God of death and his followers in saying, you do cruel things, you do bad things. May this light save you. Oh. May the Tathagata, the one who is thus gone, who has gone in the only way one can go, dissolving into the ever open, may, this, may the Tathagata teach them, teach them the six uh, transcendent qualities. That is to say, we are not going to punish the punishers. Punishment arises from a dualistic perception. A dualistic perception linked with power. I am your judge. I can punish you. I say, oh, but that's that's a deluded position. I don't want to adopt that. What what do these people need? Oh, they don't have generosity. They don't have morality or patience. 
they don't have diligence or concentration or wisdom. If they had these six qualities, they wouldn't be doing this terrible work. May they, may they, this light coming from this burning hand spread out and transform them so that they follow a path of virtue and not a path of cruelty. By this, may they develop generous attitudes towards all beings. When we are generous, we give and we give a bit more. Our concern is not so much with what I have, but do you have enough? So the generous attitude is to say, I am for the other. My resourcing is the purity of my own mind. I, I focus to awaken to my own mind. So this is wisdom. And because I am resourced, I can be a resource for others. So this is very important. We're not aiming, we're not aiming for a fixed point. Because we are open, because we can receive the potential of the ground, it can manifest through us into any of these situations according to need. Mamidi pretene su sabanju chi pretena kyantre kongye dunyale tarne sanju zembinam kanzu ki tu chi chambo chinji la ki. Zedan konge mi ponge le chu. Zepe mi shepe dan la si. Chimbe parotu chimbe wondan dambaranju chi. May the light from this lamp illuminate the realms of the hungry ghosts. May they be freed from the misery of thirst and hunger. So we remember that they have these big swollen bellies and very small mouths. They are always thirsty and hungry. And whatever they try to take into their mouth turns into molten lead or poison. So by the blessings of the great compassion of Bodhisattva Akasha Garba, may they have an inexhaustible supply of easily available food and drink. So he's uh, the name of this uh, bodhisattva means like the storehouse of the sky. Infinite resourcing. So this is what we wish for them. Why should they not have what they need? Because of their karma. But the karma arises from unawareness. So by this incredible, generous offer of burning a hand, May these rays of light be able to shine into the darkness of karmic accumulation and free beings from the ignorance which generate limitations. The cause of being reborn as a hungry ghost is uh, envy and jealousy. If you have these tendencies, then you're always looking at what have the others got? Could I get what they've got? So what we wish for them is a transcendental generosity, a generosity inseparable from emptiness, to find the source of their always being enough. Okay, so we take a break now for an hour, uh, and then we continue. And there is a lot to reflect on in, in this section. It's a very powerful method of accumulating uh, merit. And it's used for uh, helping people who have died. When uh, Thiya Lama's middle son died, uh, this was the uh, practice that Rinpoche used. Because when people die, we're never quite sure where they're going to go. So we want to direct our mind to all the possible places of rebirth and bring the light of Dharma into these places. So that if the people we are praying for and wishing well to 
should happen to be reborn there, it won't be as desolate as if no Dharma had ever arrived. So we can bear this in mind. And as we look around in our world, we can think of the people who need our prayers. Okay, see you at uh, two o'clock. Okay. <clears throat> we uh, continue with the text. Mame dine naranan kia nisu sabanju chi narangi nyungi leng empe namparamin becha. Jang, ye dunya zuparakawa nyansu yo. Baba chenwezi won't you give to je chinaki. Nyewe dunya sepa sepa mepe le. Tarane, Zupe, Paro to Chimpe, Dandan, Denver, and Chirchi. May the lamp from this lamp illuminate the hell realms. Beings suffer there according to the ripening of their previous bad actions, experiencing intolerable heat and cold. By the blessings of the compassion of the Bodhisattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, may they be freed from the limitless suffering of hell. May they realize the transcendent quality of patience. Oh, we experience hell if our activity has been governed a great deal by anger. As we know, anger is very energizing. We want to retaliate. We might want revenge. We don't have patience. So, these are the beings who profoundly need to develop patience. And the problem with uh, being born in a hell realm is that there is very little of Dharma to give you any support or encouragement or any sense of how to find a way out. You're trapped. You don't know what to do. You have no friend. We don't know what awaits us in life. Sudden provocative situations can arise. Three years ago, I would imagine most people in Ukraine had no idea of the horror that was coming to them. Not only do they have suffer all the horrors of invasion and attack and brutality, rape and so on, but they have to wait while other nations which are not invaded consider how they could be supportive, but not at too great a cost. We don't want to uh, provoke the Russians. We don't know what they would do. So cowardliness becomes a basis for endless killing and attack. And this is important for us to understand. In the book we did a couple of years ago, Me First, which is concerned with the arising of the <clears throat> great demon king, Matamrutra. He starts with a sense of entitlement. He's a winner, never a loser. But he doesn't understand the teachings. And when he asks his teacher, have I got it right? No, the teacher says, no, you haven't understood. Your servant understands, but you, you don't understand. And so he kicks his teacher and his old servant out and proceeds to do whatever he wants. And the story describes terrible situation, followed by terrible situation, followed by terrible situation. And only, only when the top, top, top Buddhist teacher has been murdered, do the Buddhas gather together and think, oh, maybe we should do something different. And this is how the wrathful Buddhas, the Herukas arise. Enough is enough. So in a situation like that, you have to think, was patience a virtue or not? If you live in a city where there are gangs, 
when the gangs become more powerful, selling drugs, running prostitution, attacking people. Maybe we should just wait until they calm down. This is probably not what's going to happen. Because all demons live on the fear of others. It's their best food. There are so many dictators in the world who are proud of the fact that people fear them. And so it's important to know when to act. So when we hear, oh, you have to practice patience, that's also true. But every situation in life is in time. And so we, so we have to develop good timing. There's a time to act and a time not to act. If you're frightened, that won't help you to know the right time. The same with climate change. Many people are going to lose their homes, their, their, their cattle are dying. Who is to be held responsible? The fact is you have to have power to call other people to account. If you have no power, no one listens to you. This is why we, it's important for us to study these Mahayana texts, but also to uh, study Tantra and Sokshen. There is a time to be sweet and a time to be nasty. If it's a time to be nasty and you continue being sweet, then this is not skillful, this is not ethical, and it's not compassionate. We are educated people. We have to think about how to uh, enact our dharma. So we end up in the hells if we have been in extreme states of anger and have harmed other people. We wish for these beings uh, compassion. May their hearts be softened. But if their hearts are not softened, then one needs to be able to be a little bit uh, more powerful than them. That is to say, as long as you are within duality and for you subject and object are real and separate, then uh, sweet uh, aspirations and dreams are not going to be enough. Because you have to look at the whole picture. When the Chinese came into Tibet, Many Tibetans were able to flee into India. And due to that, Dharma came available in the West, and we're very grateful for that. But the kindness of the Indians in offering hospitality to the Tibetans was not without cost. The Chinese have been pushing on the northern border, border of India for a long time. So... You, take, you get taken as, as a refugee and you're protected by this huge strength of the Indian army. This is an integrated system. The man with the gun protects the man of prayer. Should the man of prayer also take a gun? That's a big question. Otherwise, someone else is having to sacrifice themselves to keep you safe. Ethics is not easy. If your life is resting on someone else's sacrifice, then you owe them. A debt is created. Then it says, Marme dear Zambolinge Chirona Munagi Nana Tompe Sengerangela Paye Pa Kangwa Yami Tombala Nisur Salvarinju Chi Deda Nungile Ngempe Number min be je dan con du pele nam kala rangi chal ki ye se mo ye pe nobe ze dan con ma ye ne rangi du zimba da cha che ching ze pa de da de shin she pa wo pa me ki tu je chin ji lo ki Muna jambo tumbele tane de wachengi shingam su kibaranjuchi. 
So he says, may the light of this lamp <clears throat> illuminate the realms beyond this world system where in the darkness, benighted people cannot even see their own right hand held up in front of them. Uh, if you, it's one thing not to be able to see your hand clearly, but it's also terrible if you can't see your own thoughts and feelings, your inner life, if you can't see that clearly, then you don't know what you're up to. So we need to let the light onto our situation so that we can see how we are, but also we need to use the light of meditation and practice and the blessing of the Buddhas to help us see how we take refuge in false gods, in the items of this world and so on. So, due to the ripening of their previous bad actions, they crave food and drink, but scratch themselves with their own iron claws as they reach out to the sky and so are unsatisfied. They are exhausted and cut their own flesh and eat it. By the blessing of the compassion of the Buddha Amitabha, may they be freed from the force of that great darkness and be reborn in the pure realm of great happiness. So this is a, another description of the, like, the hungry ghosts. And there are many similar states of different kinds of beings uh, living in places we don't know. In some ways, it's also similar to the waves of uh, addiction, which are pervasive in the world. So many new drugs are coming on the market and being brought into, especially into North America. People crave something which in its structure is only likely to do them harm. They long for the thing which imprisons them. The very thing they believe that they desperately need is the thing which is very likely to kill them. So this is not talking just about something far away. It, it's all around. So say, may the light of this offering of the burning hand uh, free beings from these attachments to uh, objects that can only leave them unsatisfied so that they may be reborn in Dewa Chen, the pure realm of Buddha Amitabha, and gain freedom there. There's no drugs available in Dewa Chen. Because in a place like that, where there is beauty everywhere and the sound of Dharma is in the air, even just a small exposure to this simple happiness takes away all craving. Jenya Marme dear Louis Nesu Nanshin, Savon Juch Nena, Timodan Sene Dupe, Le Trote Tonwe Lodan Denshin, Namke Dingle Gilgipara, Mitse Sechen La Sote, Jibachembo Gile Tarne, Sanje Dan Chudan Gedon Lan Chapsudro Shin. So to Jine ki chuit le Ning la nene luna de pe yunten dandan dambaran chuchi. May the light of this lamp illuminate the realm of the Nagas. May they be freed from the snares of stupidity and envy. <clears throat> the Nagas sometimes look like snakes, sometimes like great water snakes. They have many different capacities and they are the guardians of the wealth of the earth. But the, the causal force that has people in that situation is mental dullness and envy. Because the Nagas live uh, usually under the earth. They come out, but rarely. So he says, may they practice generosity and be freed from the fears of predatory birds, heat, dry sand, and the rest of the eight great fears. Oh, clearly there are predatory birds like the Garuda that like to catch 
uh, snakes. Heat makes it difficult when they have a, a skin that needs to be kept supple. Dry sand, dry sand is hot and uh, difficult to move through if you have a side to side slithering movement. So water, things falling on them, pollution in the air, thieves, rulers, elephants, all of these are enemies for beings in these states. These are creatures who can't protect themselves very easily. So we pray, oh, may they take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and Sangha, so that the life-sustaining, uh, refreshing water of calm abiding will rest in their heart. May they gain everything they desire. So this is also for us a training in empathic attunement. Can we imagine what it would be like to be a snake? When the weather is good, you can go out in the country and lie on the ground and then wriggle around like a snake, see how you get on. Sometimes just reading the words is a little bit thin. So it, uh, you don't quite get the feeling of how it would be to be trapped in a body which only had that kind of movement. So when we do the Sokshen practice of Rushen and we imagining ourselves in different environments with different kinds of bodies as the different animals and so on. We want to have the, the direct feeling of these restrictions. This is to increase our wisdom and compassion. If we stay open with the empty ground of being, then we're never trapped, however, the physical situation. And when we see how difficult it is, we can also develop compassion for all the beings who are in these situations and increase our commitment to work for the benefit of those who cannot help themselves. This is very frightening. We are going to die. There are many places to be reborn that would not be very nice. If we forget the realms that we don't have at the moment have a direct contact with, if you just focus on the human domain and the animal domain, and you look around, the hopes for human beings, the hopes that were around maybe 50 years ago of general improvement have not been fulfilled. And even if you're reborn in a nice bourgeois family with many resources, and you do the best with your practice, so that at the time of your death, you have successfully eaten 100,000 ice creams, what is the benefit? We need Dharma. But Dharma, true Dharma that speaks to our heart is more rare than gold. This is our chance. We have to examine ourselves. What are my obscurations? Then he says, Marmedi, Tuchi, Chimbone, Su, Dangshin, Sovereign, Juchi, De, Tuchi, Chimbo, Dunga, Shine, Yawa, Jamso, Number, Trubi, Shu, Dan, Dan, Dumper, and Juchi. May the light of this lamp illuminate the realm of the great reptiles. May their sufferings be removed. So these giant reptiles come in different forms. Uh, they can be seen swimming on the bottom of the ocean. Many of the deep sea creatures can be considered in this way. But usually they're quite vulnerable, like walruses. Because when the modern Western people arrived, they weren't hunting the walrus with a bow and arrow. They could shoot them with a high-powered rifle at a distance. If no one values your existence, then how, how, will, you, how will you survive? 
all over the world, species are being killed off by human behavior. So the Dharma is something to work with, something to apply to the world that you experience and to apply to yourself as you experience yourself. So he says, may they gain the magical power to abide in oceans of great happiness. I think many whales would like to have that power. With our obsession with knowledge, we have all these uh, satellites up in the sky, scanning the sky, the earth, the oceans, trying to work out what is going on. With the collapse of the Berlin Wall, there was the beginning of the end of the Stasi state. But we live in, we live in a Stasi world now. CCTV is everywhere. People are checking on what you're doing, why you're doing it. Every aspect of our lives can be assessed mathematically. So we truly pray, may all these great snakes and whales and deep sea sharks gain the magical power to hide away from interrogation and be at home in the ocean of happiness. And he says that Marmedia Zambolinge Chinepe Sadata Sadata Luda Sadagi Jalpo Patili Da Saye Jamo Chambo Da and Jamso Chambo Da Sertranda in Zinda Trumpala Niparagida Lu Chambo Da Lu Tramo Da Chinmeda Lumana nepeda, gari tumbe gula neparada, rina boda yada shada, parida, na chamboda shinchida, sulakam dance, chuten down, trun kenda, juna nepara nesu nan shin salwaran ju shi. So he says, may the light from this lamp illuminate the areas beyond the continent of Jambudvipa, occupied by land gods, local gods, Nagas, Pitali, the king of the land gods, the great queen of the land, and the gods and denizens of oceans, seas, ponds, and wells, big rivers, small rivers, springs, seasonal ponds, and those who stay at the high glacial streams, black mountains, slate hills, water meadows, hill fields, big forests, solitary trees, temples, stupas, cities and villages. May all those who stay in these places be illuminated. Now, he could just have said everywhere. But by listing all these places, he's encouraging us to be curious. What's it like to be a snail? What's it like to be an insect that lives for only one day with very little uh, conceptual uh, elaboration in the mind, just the, the immediacy of sensation and the wind and so on. So when we look at these creatures and we remember that we also have the capacity to be born there, because this text is bring, bringing you some shocking news. You are not inherently a human being. Being a human being arises due to causes and circumstances. If you have this good fortune, it's certainly probably more useful for Dharma than being born as a frog or an insect. But even if you're born as a human, many bad things can happen. The tradition of uh, understanding of karma is very precise. If you plant wheat, you get wheat. If you plant oats, you get oats. If you plant bad deeds, selfish thoughts, me first, pushy aggressive, aggressivity, the result will not be fine. And if you practice virtue, if you're kind, if you help the weak, if you help the sick, 
if you are thoughtful about the impact of your actions on other people, this will ripen as a good rebirth. If you truly open to the openness, the unborn openness of the mind, then you no longer identify as a subject or an object. But as long as you do identify as this person, if you review your life, clearly in interaction, sometimes you have been more subject and sometimes more object. You can act, but you are also acted on. So that's why the teaching always say, as long as you are under the power of duality, ethics must be your principal concern. In terms of the law, you can get away with it. Many powerful people are never punished, at least in their present life. But you cannot escape karma. So it's vital to consider all these different possibilities and places and make a strong decision. Not only will I not go there myself, but I will empty these places of those who are trapped by their own bad actions. So to, at the end, he's saying, may each of these beings have their own particular confusions removed. Whatever situation we're in, whether we are young and beautiful and everyone wants to sleep with us, or we're old and tired and people just blank us in the street. We have to see that in the first case, it's not because, oh, I am so special. Or in the second situation, oh, this is a sign I am so unspecial. Nobody likes me or is interested in me. So the particular confusions of each situation is our tendency to take the shape of our existence at any time as being the truth of our existence. There is no substantial truth to anyone's situations. So we want them to be free of confusion, but also may they have unchanging faith in the three jewels. What's the unchanging faith in the three jewels in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha goes a very, very long way. It's an infinite vehicle to carry us as far as we need to go. So if we focus on things in the world, if we say, may there be peace in the Ukraine, may there be resources for repairing the effects of war in the Ukraine, may all the landmines in Ukraine cause no harm to innocent people. May free Ukraine have a climate which is not too hot in the summer, not too cold in the winter. When, that is to say, when you think of a specific situation, there's no end to the number of requests you want to make. Because in samsara, it's never quite right. So don't be pulled into reactivity by the ever-changing turbulence of the world. Then he says, may they gain an altruistic intention towards enlightenment and establish the cause of liberation. Oh, may they become bodhisattvas. May they really step out of their egoic self-concern and be available to work for the benefit of all. And this establishes the cause of liberation for the manifestation of the Sambhogakaya and the Nirmanakaya. But we also need to follow the path of wisdom and open directly to our own unborn ground. And then we, then we have the clarity we need. So then he says, this concludes the aspiration of King Golden Hand. So, what is our Dharma life worth? What are we willing to sacrifice for it? Many people sacrifice their holidays uh, in order to go to retreats. They might uh, 
find difficulties in family life because their partner doesn't want them spending so much time in study and practice. So it's a real question for us. What am I willing to give up to have more Dharma in my life? Now, because we're looking <clears throat> at the moment in a, through a dualistic lens, the question becomes one of either or. Either I play football with my children in the park or I take some time to meditate. So this is a, 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 a this sets you up for many difficult, painful choices. If I take care of my kids, then I'm betraying my Dharma life. If I take care of my Dharma life, then it's as if I'm betraying and abandoning my kids. So we have to remember that the approach that we've been reading here in this section of the book is a view. There are nine yanas or vehicles or ways of proceeding, and each has a view. So this view is based on being clear there are good things to do, dharma things to do, and bad things to do, non-dharma things to do. But then it's as if there is a samsara commodity and a dharma commodity. And if I pick up the samsara commodity, playing football in the park, my hands are filled so I can't hold on to dharma at the same time. But when we turn our mind to the view of Sokshen, it is focused on non-duality so that we can access both this and that. It's not an either or choice because if we go deeply into the Dharma and we see that from the very beginning, I myself have no personal substance Oh, in the springtime in London, you can see plants shooting up because of the sun and the rain. So we see these, uh, I don't know, tulips, for example. Look how they grow. They grow by incorporating non-tulip. They take minerals from the earth, water from the earth. They turn the non-tulip into tulip. And if we leave them growing, gradually the petals fall off. And the stalk and the leaves start to collapse. And then they rot. And this nutrition goes into the earth. So this is the same for us. The mother is able with the fetus inside her body to not interrupt the flow of nutrition from the mother's body into the baby. Oh, the child is made from mother. It's not made from itself. And the mother is nurtured by the five elements. The child is born and starts to grow and becomes more independent. I am independent. I'm just me. And then, if you get old, then, like me, you have to depend on the doctors and the tests which are done. I've been living in my body for a long time. And somehow it always felt like my body. But now I have to go to the hospital and go into a scanner. And then afterwards, I'm told the result I'm told about my body. Hmm. So what about the body that I know? The doctor has access to a body called James's body, but it's not really my body. So, but both, because I'm a bit sick, I need the help of the people who see the, uh, the body of James, which is not directly accessible to James. So now the doctor's idea of James's body seems more important than James's idea of James's body. Then we see, oh, 
due to causes and conditions, James has been able to live for a long time in the delusion that this body is James's body. I am situationally James or circumstantially James, but I am not inherently James. So this is where we see the nature of rebirth again and again, influenced by our karma and our unawareness, brings us to many, many experiences which we identify with. When we watch the birds flying in the sky, especially maybe the swifts or the swallows, how do they do it? <laughs> it's amazing. I, I can't imagine flying like that. And it could be that when they look at me, they think, wow, how do you do that walking? When we find ourselves identified in a particular situation, it feels like just me. So this kind of text is saying, uh-uh, look again and again, everything arises in dependent origination due to the interaction of complex causes you manifest in your present form for a while. So then there is a colophon written where it says, by the sponsoring of these lamps and the offering of this transient display, may I and all the infinite sentient beings be reborn at the feet of Buddha Dipamkara. So, offering, this is about burning burning lamps. If somebody dies, it's quite common to burn as many lamps as you can afford. It could be just one or it could be a thousand or more. And we hope that uh, this will benefit the person. We dedicate the merit of the burning of the lamp for the other. By this virtue, may I and all sentient beings gain enlightenment at the feet of Buddha Dipamkara. May we gain perfect Buddhahood and become benefactors of all beings. So if, if someone dies, someone close to you, it's very useful to read this practice and reflect on who it is who has died. If, say your mother has died. You might have felt very close to your mother. What is quite difficult then is to realize that my mother was only my mother due to causes and circumstances. Not just that she became pregnant with me on the basis of having sex with my father, but she took on a human form according to the, as the result of having accumulated sufficient good karma for that. And as she moves into death, the patterning of her karma is different from the time when she moved into birth. And so there is a potential to go into many different forms. So my human mother was, was only human due to circumstances. I also am only human due to circumstances. I have some stability in my knowledge of how the world is, the culture of my country and so on. And so I'm able to make choices and navigate a reasonable life for myself. But imagine when you die. This body, this point of reference, this seemingly stable base for your emergence into the world, this is dissolved. You're blown by the winds of karma, the tendencies which manifest. Who will help you at that time? Not your own actual parents, not your friends, not your colleagues. You've lost access to them. You are alone. And it's scary. There are choices to be made. According to the tradition, if you're going to be born human, you wander in the bardo like a long tunnel, and then you see a couple having sex. Maybe they're not the best couple in the world. But if you've spent your life uh, 
drinking every bottle of wine that was placed in front of you and watching endless porn movies, then your power to resist the arising excitement, ooh, I want that, will be very little. So that's why we have a chance. We are alive. We can study and practice Dharma. We can observe our own impulsivity. The pool to eat when we want to eat and drink when we want to drink. This may be pleasurable in the moment. But if you always follow your impulse, it is unlikely that you will see that the impulse has no truth to itself, no inherent existence. Again, we follow the middle way not too tight, not too much uh, imposition of rules and regulations, but also not too loose so that we're not chaotic and all over the place. So with that, we are able to sit in the practice, thoughts arise, and they pass. We can know this intellectually, but as long as our dualistic interpretation is strong, anyway, I continue, but as long as our um, intellectual, maybe our intellectual understanding is strong, but as long as our impulses keep driving us, then it's very difficult. Therefore, we must go into the practice and sit relaxed and open and not go under the power of impulses. Yeah, that's, that's enough. Now we take a break and we come back at quarter two. Good. Good. We have a break. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I'm just trying to find Kati. Okay, but where is here? Ah, there you are. There is your here. Okay, good. Good. <clears throat> so we had last uh, weekend we did the, all the different sections of the practice, and, and we were imagining that. Um, we, we had uh, turned into this uh, Dakini who then manifested many different offering goddesses. And uh, so that was a kind of clear beginning. But uh, here it's not so clearly defined. So if you were going to do this intermediately, uh, intermediate section on the Sutra of King Golden Hand, you would be not in the visualization of yourself as the Dakini, nor for the final section that we're just going to uh, go into. So you were, you, you, we started with, I am the red Dakini, from my heart comes the white Dakini, from her radiate the many different offering goddesses. This is the play of the mind. I imagine that I am James. I imagine that I am the Red Dakini and all the stages. This is the patterning of the potential of our mind. If, if we are all imagining that we become the Red Dakini, this will arise in a different way for all of us. There is no objective out there existing in itself, Red Dakini. But neither is there in here a self-existing James. Everything is a potential for shape-shifting, for finding uh, patterns which fit the current circumstances. So in an instant, you can dissolve out of being the red dakini with the white dakinis and so on and you're just in your ordinary imagined form it's not that you were 
your ordinary self, then you become this special Dakini and you go back to your ordinary self. We have no real self. What I, what I call myself is a formation according to circumstances. It depends on the many factors that operate in any moment. It is because I am not a thing that I can manifest as the red Dakini. And uh, being the red Dakini is not a better kind of thing. It is a kind of aesthetic appreciation of the plasticity of our potential that it can shift and move. So, on releasing or dissolving or observing the vanishing of the red dakini, I'm here with this illusory form. Indeed, this is central for us. The form is the showing. Whatever that is for you, whether it's bright or dull or clear or small or big, there is no ideal form. If you see a painting of a red dakini, that's someone else's idea. If we've done previous practice with Padmasambhava, we are Padmasambhava. It doesn't mean that we need to try to look like Padmasambhava. Padmasambhava is appearance and emptiness. And our inner sense of Padmasambhava is clarity and emptiness. And our awareness, which allows us to have the experience, is uh, awareness and emptiness, or rikton. And we have the similar, if you were there on Wednesday with the Medicine Buddha practice, you have a similar uh, experience. You're doing the recitation of the mantra and then kind of it stops. What happens to the visualization? So I will write some something about that and it'll go up on the website soon. When you visualize, it's like making sand cattle. Sandcastle, yeah. So when you're a kid, you get a little bucket and you put the sand inside and you tap it down and then you turn it upside down and you get a little dome. So if the sand is not too dry so that it just is individual grains and not too wet so that it's very heavy, the, the shape of the of the the mold will continue for a while. There is no essence to the sand. There is no essence to us. Yet we manifest. Manifesting is a verb, it's a movement, it's a changing interaction with the environment. There is no self, no fixed self. And yet we're here. But moment by moment, in a slightly different sense of ourself. So we are dynamically selfing within the field of formations of illusory selves. So now we come to the final part of the, the, the book. So it says, Namo Guru Devada Kini, Dene Zunti Tsera Tanshi Du, Kada Palden Lama Goji Chang, Kuji Yeshi Nga Idagni Chen, Kyoda Drame Tsewe. So we say, I bow to the gurus, dakinis, deities. So again, we're changing gear before we were the red dakini. Now we're in this more usual form, but keeping the essence of emptiness, the essence of the dakini, and we bow to the, the gurus, deities, and dakinis. So we have to remember Siya Lama wrote this when he was in India. He had said goodbye to his guru many years before his guru was still in Tibet. Now it was not possible to go back into Tibet. So he written this uh, Batalam offering as a gesture for the long life of his guru. 
many uh, lamas didn't actually spend very much time with their root guru. In the structure in Tibet, in the educational system, the, these young lamas had exposure to many different kinds of teacher. The root guru is the one who gives you a direct sense of your own mind, not as a concept, but as a living presence. And with that, you live within the here and now. But if you're in your conceptual identity, you're thinking about what you did in the past, the things that you learned, what you hope to do in the future. So he's writing this from his uh, presence in his own presence. He's just completely here. He's been, and he says, and we say with him, from this time in all my lives, pervading Lord, glorious Guru Vajradhara, with the nature of the four modes and the five original knowings, may I never separate from you, held by your compassion. May I serve and please you with my body, speech, and mind. So, <clears throat> glorious Guru Vajradhara, Vajradhara is like the highest Buddha, like, he's a bit like um, Kundasampo. So he's saying to uh, Sutram Zampo, his own teacher, you are the master of all dharmas, and you have the three the three kayas and their integration, which is the fourth kaya. That is to say, body, voice, and mind are completely inseparable from the pure ground. And you have the five wisdoms, which are the absence of the five poisons. So if we're not grasping at either self or other as inherently real, we start to appreciate the Dharmudatta Jhana, the wisdom or original knowing of infinite hospitality. So we say, may I never separate from you, held by your compassion. You, you will hold me with your compassion, but maybe I'll get a little bit lost. But my intention is I don't want to separate from you. In serving the guru with body, voice, and mind means to make sure that your body is used for virtue, your speech is used for virtue, and your mind is used for virtue. And doing the, the tasks and uh, responsibilities that the guru gives to you. So then say, okay, that's your so regarding this jewel-like human body, possessing the freedoms and opportunities that are so difficult to gain, each of us has this precious body. We have the chance to go to the heart of the universe. No one is stopping us doing this, except ourselves. So we should protect this jewel of our contact with the Dharma, our gaining teachings which help us to understand the purpose of the practice, and then polish the jewel through our own practice. At least say the difficulty of <clears throat> gaining this precious human birth with its connection with Dharma is as rare as the stars you can see in the daytime. And he says, we do not know how long it will remain. Therefore, always keeping aware of the non-deceptive nature of karma, may we be freed from this foul swamp of samsara. In the Sudan at the moment, there is the beginning of a big civil war. Two groups of people, fighting for power, each one determined to win. This results in many people dying. The people who are causing the war are going to die. We're all going to die. But in order to get 
the status I want, I'm happy to kill other people. This is a madness. So this is why it's saying samsara is like a swamp. So many of the big dictators in the world have, are very, very sensitive to what they take to be insults to their status and prestige. If you insult me, I have to kill you because it's for my honor. 200 years ago, fighting duels was very popular for my honor. This is the meaning of this foul swamp of samsara. We are stupid, but we have a chance to uh, awaken to our true nature. So he says, Jile Kyuche Lame Konjonsu. So la Bakyan Yama Midoshin Kyuche Mena Dunguta. Rochante Nyamni Chanchu Sem Damitra Sho. The unsurpassed three jewels who protect from fear, we will never abandon even at the cost of our lives. No, we are not heroes. Oh, if I pull out a gun and say, if you are a Buddhist, I shoot you. Oh, I've never been a Buddhist. Why would I be a Buddhist? Man with a gun, didn't I see you in the church, synagogue, masjid? Communist Party? Where was it? We met somewhere. We are very similar. Yeah, best not to be heroic because you keep you keep the, your feelings in your heart. We train our minds with the seven part practice of cause and effect. So in the text, we've got these, uh, the seven are listed there. And they are very important to, to develop for ourselves. So the first, all sentient beings have been our mother. I am always already connected with every sentient being. Moreover, they have been very kind to me. So thirdly, I must repay this kindness. So this is a, 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 a general level way of reminding yourself that you are part of this field of connectivity. You're not an isolated individual. <clears throat> to repay this kindness, we must love all our mothers. It means we must want the very best for them. Appreciate their true quality, which is the light shining out of their eyes. This is the vitality of awareness. And we must develop true compassion for the, our mothers. But now they are a bit lost. So we must develop the two bodhicittas, which is the, the altruistic intention, which is an aspiration. I want to work for the benefit of all beings. And secondly, the altruistic intention, which is, I am daily working for the benefit of all sentient beings through my practice, which includes all sentient beings. Now, we have busy lives, not so much time. So it's important uh, to keep to the essence of the practice. In the ritual text, there are many, sometimes lengthy ways of developing bodhicitta and reminding ourselves to do the practice without forgetting others and then to dedicate the merit. But the key thing is to do everything for the benefit of others. As some of us have looked many times now, the Dharmakaya or the intrinsic uh, original knowing or clarity of our mind, this is for us. And then, if you like, the inner experience or the inner imagining, which is the Sambhogakaya, the visionary experience, this is for the other. And our being in the world with others, the, our manifesting and connecting with others, 
this is for the other. If we release ourselves from identification with the patterns of our passing thoughts, then we will be able to connect with others through connecting with the openness of our mind. When we're sitting in the practice and thoughts and feelings and memories arise, don't block them, don't try to get rid of them, and don't fuse with them. We're just open. And it's peaceful. And we are at ease. This is the first statement of Garab Dorji. See your own naked face. You can't see it as an object because it's not an object. You see it by being it. This is enough. This can be your uh, abiding sight in all situations. This is open like the sky. Then experience arises. Sometimes it seems subject. That is to say, it's like thoughts, memories, plans. And sometimes it seems like an object, like something I see outside. But both of these are simply experiences, ungraspable. So when we uh, relax in that state, all, sorry, all the potential, which had previously been turned towards myself, what do I want, how do I feel about myself, do I love you or not, all of these conceptual constructs have no need, I have no need of them, there is no basis for them. And so the preformations or the tendencies on the basis of which I will get involved for my sake, they also dissolve. So when I was in, <clears throat> in uh, art school in the pottery studio, we would explore making different shapes. Very few of them were really great. So at the end of each day, we would take them to this big metal chute and put them all inside and the machine would start to merge all the pieces of clay together, churning it and churning it until it was one uh, integral piece. So the next day the, there was fresh clay. The potential had been given a shape and then returned into its base potential as clay. So when you are sitting in the practice, various thoughts and feelings arise. If we don't react to them, they vanish. And in that vanishing, it's as if they become some fertilizer for the next day and the next day and the next day. And the key point is this, that if, sorry, if you're feeding the open potential, then it's a 100% gain. You are not feeding anything in particular. But if you're identified with your own current state, your body, your likes, your dislikes, your favorite painter, you prefer Michelangelo to Leonardo da Vinci, whatever your uh, fixation, the danger is that the potential will feed into your commitment to a prepositioning. So, <clears throat> fresh, this is the governing word for us. The ground is always fresh. It's described as kada, pure from the very beginning, it means not touched, not contaminated. And as we participate in the world, being with other people, talking with them, on projects with them, each moment can be fresh as long as we don't import. If we are resting in the here and now, <clears throat> the infinite openness of this moment, then 
then everything is within this. And if we stay with this, it's enough. This is a paradox that if you stay open just as it is right now, there's no end to the potential. But if you go chasing something which seemed to be special because you want to hang on, this fixation will blind you to the richness of the field. So you should relax, stay open, fresh, and allow the spontaneous movement of the mind to continue while we don't stray from the Dharmakaya. So in this way, we are in the world with others and like as going through these seven points and saying, all beings must get enlightenment and for their benefit, I must develop this altruistic intention. It is this looks like a dualistic positioning, but it's maintained within non-duality. And this brings us to the seventh point. Our own result will be enlightenment. The stillness of the Dharmakaya never changes. The movement of the Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya never changes. So he says, may we never be separated from the relative altruistic openness in, of participation with others and never separate from the absolute altruistic uh, concern for others. Mm -hmm. And it's absolute because it's not separable from emptiness. Wisdom and compassion must be together. They are together. It is our mental activity which seems to separate them. Then he continues, Jina Jita Rira Lishida Nang Chupunkam Chimche De Yon So Samara Re Kime Chanchu Se Yasa Yere De Jay Mendad Jalwe Yabchi Kula Pulnu Sho. The outer container of the world with Mount Meru and the four continents and the inner contents which constitute all beings with their different aspects and discern and all discernible phenomena. And the secret unborn bodhicitta, which or in, enlightenment, which is my own awareness, which is not different from the joyful secret mandala of awareness and hospitable space. I am aware of the space within which everything arises. Some of what arises is very intimate. It's uh, the most subtle uh, sense of how phenomena arise. Some is my experience of sentient beings and uh, the patterns of phenomena in this world I encounter. And some is the outer shape of the world, which seems to be fixed and given, although it isn't. This is just a rather complicated way of seeing, of saying everything, absolutely everything, without any exception. Then we say to you, uh, the, the, the sole father, the singular father of all the Buddhas, may we have the power to offer all of this to you. What I want is my own empty mind. All occurrence I offer to you. So then he says, Chudan Chichen, number Chichen, Dimbra Madru Chinang Gume Chu, Nansi Semsu Yimbra Tachuchi, Yudu Zamo Tsukara Kochen, Namshi Drunam, Soso Nije Sho. Distinguishing clearly between object and subject, that we, we can see that these are ways of categorizing experience with that basic clarity. We can then, sorry, can you go? With that basic clarity, we can then recognize that there is no actual basis for this because all outer and inner phenomena are seen to be illusory. 
So if you're sitting doing your practice, some of what's arising feels like me. And some of what's arising doesn't feel like me. Okay. So that's not the same. But when we look and we see, oh, this is an experience, and that is also an experience. There is no inherent existence in inner experience or in outer experience. So we see that outer and inner phenomena are illusory. They're always vanishing. So there's nothing to hold on to. And yet they're always arising. So you can't say that they don't exist at all. So he says, clearly experiencing that all possible appearances are the play of the mind. May we practice the profound offering assembly with our illusory bodies and thus make each of the four classes of guests happy. So <clears throat> trees are the play of the mind. And if you're at night out in the dark doing chud, the sound of the wind howling in the trees is also empty. And the body you identify so strongly with is also is like an illusion. So may we offer this through the practice of church to uh, the higher guests, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha and the second level, the Buddha Sattvas, uh, meditation deities and Dakinis, and then to all sentient beings and to the people to whom I owe something. These four classes of guests want something different. So by them operating together, every single aspect that I cling on to, whether it's internal or external, will be consumed and vanish into the great emptiness. So then it says, Lama Doji Semba Chivot Kompo, Nimbo Toshi Shatan Rati, Rabjete, Shina Kinzang, Kunjung Kunzairu, Ka Chum Dende Mach, Dan Yermepe. Alden la me coson to zumbi. Sama sami cape doji naljo chutni yon wa chinji lo. So meditating on the Guru as Vajrasattva. So he sits on the crown of our head. So may we confess with the four antidotes to. Uh, the stains of our karmic accumulation. The, in the early part of the book, Simply Being, there is a, a chapter on Vajrasattva written by Siyarama. So we purify uh, our mind on the basis of uh, having the witness, which is to say uh, the uh, assembly of the three jewels, the three roots, and the three kayas. They are the pure ones. We feel regret for the bad things we've done. And we confess the sins. That is to say, what is hidden inside me, I bring it out through my mouth, and I say, I did this. Or if no one's there, I can write it down. This is vital, because I do not want to be conditioned by the past. Doing the purificatory practice of Vajrasattva returns you to the present moment. You're here in the here and now. The past is gone. You're not waiting for the future. It's just this. And on the basis of this, we renew our vows to maintain our non-difference from Padmasambhava. Oh, yeah. so we pray to. We say, Glorious Guru, you who are not different from the source of all blessings. That is to say, Kunzang uh, Heruka and Chonden De Macho. This is the uh, Yabyum or the inseparable form of the most powerful Heruka. That is to say, the power of anger, 
to reject any attempt to invade you. And we say, I, may we all, all sentient beings, gain the blessing of the excellent yoga of the secret inconceivable vajras of your body, speech, and mind. Because when we study uh, tantric practice, there is a lot of symbolization, a lot of uh, the best, the most excellent, the highest, and so on. But actually, the true nature of your own body, this ordinary flesh and blood body, and the true nature of your speech with which you say confused things and maybe tell lies from time to time, in the true nature of your mind, which is full of funny thoughts and memories and impulses, the true nature of these three is Vajra, indestructible, and this is not different from the highest Buddha. So <clears throat> that's the ending of this practice. And you've been reciting it in your usual body, which you, which you're clear is an illusion. In the in the colophon, which you can read, Shia Lama say describing how his guru Sutran Zambo told him to go to India and do a retreat in uh, Sopema. So this is a place where uh, Padma Sambhava. Uh, got into trouble by climbing into a nunnery to be with Mandarava. And her father was the king, and when he found out, he was very angry, and he, he got his men to grasp Padmasambhava, and they tied him and brought all kinds of bundles of wood and oil and burnt him alive. And they went away. But after three days, the smoke was still rising in the sky. So the king sent someone to check what was happening. And there was Padmasambhava sitting in the center of a lake on a big lotus, smiling at everyone. So it's a wonderful uh, pilgrimage place. So thinking about his guru uh, while he was in a three-year retreat and he he was recently married, so his wife was there with him. And there he wrote this uh, prayer. And then later he adapted it when he was in Nepal. So that's uh, how, how the Bhattaram prayer is. It's a very useful way of reminding yourself about the view of the different uh, yanas or approaches. And then there are three short concluding prayers. The first is the dedication of merit. By this virtue, may I quickly attain the state of the lotus born. Then may I establish all beings without exception in that same state. Oh, the dedication of merit is very important because it's a, again, it's a way of reminding us I don't do the practice just for me and I'm not hanging on to any special little bit just for me. This is for the benefit of all. Then we have this verse from the Bodhicharya Avatara which was very uh, a great favorite of Sia Lamas. Bamba Zamba Sangekya Sanje Chule Kepana Sanje Malu Tanshiki De Don Sumba Murchingo. When merely the thought of helping others is more excellent than the worship of the Buddhas, it is unnecessary even to mention the greatness of striving for the happiness and welfare of all beings without exception. And so this is very, again, very important for practice because we think, oh, the Buddha is very special. We should worship the, the Buddhas. That must be a wonderful thing to do. But Shantideva, this great scholar and meditator says, such ritual activity is nothing compared to the thought of helping others. 
of course, there are different ways of thinking about this. But he's saying, listen, the Buddhas are sorted. <laughs> They're okay. Think about all these poor people wandering around in samsara. They're the ones that need help, so focus on them. Don't forget the lost. Don't forget the lonely. And then we, the last uh, verse is uh, an aspiration for the flourishing of the Dharma. So, this is if this is our aspiration, our hope, our wish that the Dharma will flourish, that it will grow and get stronger, so that all difficulties, without any exception, will be pacified. And good, harmonious, creative conditions will be available, like the treasury of the sky. The powerful Buddha, the victor Padmasambhava, his doctrines must live long and shine brightly. And then the mantra, the, the indestructible guru who has the three kayas, this is Padmasambhava, grant us accomplishment. And the accomplishment we want is to be exactly identical with Padmasambhava. So we brought this uh, text to a conclusion. And tomorrow we'll look at the text from Dujan Rinpoche. Only we can decide to make the time to study Dharma. Think of all the years of your life you spent going to school studying many things which are not very useful to you now. This is our karma, to be born into a culture in samsara where the concerns of society are about worldly success and not spiritual progression. Oh, years of our life have gone by to no good purpose. We were not, not aware of this. And nor were our parents, because they were immersed in the local culture. But now we have a sense of this. This is our chance. We have this support and the text available. It's up to us whether we make use of it or not. So I wish you well with the text. And we meet tomorrow at uh, 10. And... Uh, Today, I thank the translators and especially Kati translating from German and Mariana translating from Spanish. Good. See you tomorrow. Bye for now. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao,